Sorry, everyone. Uh, Resharing this time, hopefully with sound. In each match, teams can expect to have. Hello, my name is Laurie Shaw. This work was done at Harvard University uh, and in close collaboration with Sudarshan Gopaladesikan, who is the head of sports data science at SL Benfica. So let's start with a bit of background. In soccer, a corner kick is awarded when a defending player knocks the ball over his or her goal line, except, of course, into the goal itself. The opponent then restarts play with an uncontested corner kick from the corner of the field closest to where the ball went out. There are, on average, about 10 corners per match, five per team. This means that in each match, teams can expect to have about five situations in which they can execute routines that they have planned and rehearsed in training. So let's first take a look at the example of the strategies used in corner situations. I'm going to show you a video in which I've also inlaid a movie that I created from the tracking data. We'll consider the attacking team first. The team in red, Toronto FC, have a corner and the ball will come from the lower left portion of the screen. They've positioned four players in a cluster towards the edge of the area, as marked here and also here, um, and two players in the six yard box, as indicated here and here. As I run the movie, you'll see that the cluster of four players make diverging runs towards different areas of the goal mouth. And one of the players that's initially positioned in the six yard box runs out towards the ball, uh, either as a decoy or to try to intercept the ball early. So now let's watch it again from the defensive side and I'll slow it down this time. The defending team assigned four players to mark man-to-man -man each of the four attacking players at the edge of the box. They also placed three players in zonal marking roles. Um, these players have been asked to defend a high value space or zone around the goal. So as the corner develops, you can see how the two zonal players here um, do not attempt to follow the player that runs between them towards the ball as the ball is crossed into the box. Despite the opportunity to prepare for them, the rate at which corner kicks are directly converted into goals is very low. Uh, this table shows the percentage of corners that produced a goal in five different leagues. The conversion rate was typically less than 2%, or one goal every 50 corners, which is equivalent to a goal every 10 games per team. Some teams, however, have gotten pretty good at them. For example, SC Micheland in the Danish Superliga have achieved conversion rates of 5%. That's nearly three times the league average and equivalent to a goal every 20 corners, or on average, a goal every four games. FC Michelin have attributed their success to careful planning and meticulous execution of corner strategies. And they are known to dedicate substantially more time and training to practicing set pieces than most elite sides across Europe. So it is clearly possible for teams to increase the productivity of their corner kicks, but perhaps they do not want to dedicate precious time and training to them. The motivation of this work was to see if we can find ways to increase the effectiveness of corner kick situations by classifying and evaluating the distinct strategies used by teams in large samples of tracking data to measure their corner playbooks. On the offensive side, we want to identify the distinct routines that a team has used in the past, defined by the coordinated runs of the players and the delivery location of the ball. And on the defensive side, we'd like to know which players have been assigned man marking roles and which have been told to zonally mark and where these zones are located. And ultimately, can we identify the most effective attacking routines to use against a particular defensive setup? So the first question is, how do we measure and classify the runs of the attacking players? Our method starts by considering where the players end their runs, what I'll call their target positions. Here is a plot of the location of all attacking players in our sample of just over 1,700 corners, about 15,000 players, measured one second after the first ball contact following the corner. Note the big cluster of players in and around the six yard box, which reflects where the ball is typically delivered, and also the large cluster in the top left hand corner, which corresponds to the position of the corner taker after the kick. We fit a 15 component Gaussian mixture model to these target positions to identify distinct target zones. We find that 15 components, that is 15 bivariate normal distributions, are sufficient to describe the data, and adding more components does not improve the, significantly the log likelihood of the fit. 
Of the 15 zones, we are only interested in the seven zones located in the penalty area, which we've referred to as the active target zones. Any player that ends in or near one of these seven zones is included in our analysis. The other players are ignored. Now let's look at the initial positions of the players exactly two seconds before the corner kick is taken. We're interested in players that will reach one of these seven target zones, and I've highlighted these players here in blue. You can see that these players form two clusters, one in the six yard box and one near the penalty spot. We fit a six component Gaussian mixture model to the players colored blue. That's those that will finish their runs in an active target zone. And we call these the initial zones and I've labeled them from one through to six. We define an active attacking player as one that starts their run in one of the six initial zones and ends in one of the seven target zones. And in total, there are 42 possible run types in this system. All the runs made in a single corner kick can then be represented by a 42 element vector in which each element corresponds to a unique run that is combination of initial and target zones with its value representing the number of players that made that run. And it's worth emphasizing that our encoding of the different run types made by the attacking players also makes it easier to communicate new routines to players. For each routine, players only need to remember their own run code, for example, 1A, 2D, and so on. And once a team's analysts have identified the routines to use in the next match, this system can help coaches to make maximal use of the time they've allotted in training to practicing. Now, the runs made by attacking players are coordinated and synchronized. Some players will attempt to draw away defenders, while others will attempt to intercept the ball. The second step of our method used non-negative matrix factorization to find the most frequently occurring run combinations in our sample, what we refer to as features. This plot here shows the 30 frequently occurring run combinations in our data set. And I'll refer you to the accompanying paper on the conference website for the technical details of this process. Oh we can represent any corner routine as a weighted combination of two to three of these features. So here is an example of a corner from our sample. It only shows the attacking players and the dot is their initial positions and the dashed lines show their trajectories as the ball is crossed into the box. And this corner can be represented by combinations of features 12, 18 and 25. So now by clustering corners based on the similarity of their features, we can achieve our goal of constructing playbooks of the corner routines used by individual teams. So here are four distinct corner routines used frequently by Team X in our data. The top images show a characteristic example of each routine, and then the bottom images show some other examples. And it's clear that each routine has its own distinct characteristics. So now let's move on to the analysis of defensive strategies. These two images show the trajectories of the players in two corner kicks. In each, the red team is attacking and the blue team is defending. So focusing on the defending team, the left-hand left image shows a classic example of a zonal marking system. The initial positions of the defenders are uncorrelated with the attacking team and as are their trajectories. Whereas on the right-hand side, we see an example of a hybrid defensive system. There are defenders that are man marking um, their opponents, tracking their opponent as they move. Um, but there are also two zonal defenders um, at the near post and at the edge of the six yard box. Our goal is to identify the role of each defender using tracking data alone. To do this, we used information in the positions and the trajectories of the defenders and their proximity to the attacking players as class predictors. We then trained a boosted decision tree to calculate the probability that each active defender was marking zonally or man to man. Training data was provided by Benfica's analysts who watched videos of 500 corners and manually classified the roles of just under 4,000 defenders involved. And using tenfold cross-validation, we achieved a classification accuracy of 83%. That is, our algorithm was able to correctly predict the roles of five in every six defenders in the training set. With our role classification algorithm, we can now automatically tag the roles of each defender. So here are two movies um, of the corners that I showed in the previous slide. Now we're also indicating the role classifications of each defender. Big blue circles indicate um, zonally marking defenders, uh, whereas stars indicate uh, mark defenders that are marking man-to-man. -man. In the left example, there are clearly no man-marking players. All active defenders are correctly classified as zonal, whereas in the right-hand image, um, we can clearly see five man-marking players and the two zonally marking players. 
By automatically identifying zonally marking defenders in our tracking data, our methodology enables us to analyze the effectiveness of different configurations of zonal defenders. Finally, as an example of the applications of this work, I will now compare the defensive strength of two different hybrid systems that we use frequently and by multiple different teams over two seasons. Here is a heat map of the first system. It has four zonal defenders positioned in a ring around the goal mouth. The X's indicate the most likely positions of each defender. This system was used by the defending team in 366 corners in our sample. The second system has just two zonal markers, one at the near post and one in the middle of the six yard box. And this system was used in 600 corners. And of course, in both systems, there are man-to-man -man defenders that are not shown. Now let's look at the shots and goals conceded by each system. The blue dots indicate the delivery location of corners that produced a shot on goal. And then the stars indicate uh, corners that produced a goal. In the four zone system, most of the shots came from corners delivered outside of the six yard box. However, in the two zone system, about a third of shots were from corners delivered into the six yard box and almost two thirds of the goals. And in fact, you can see that many of the goals came from corners that were delivered right in between the two zonally marking players. Overall, while the two zone system was slightly less likely to allow a shot on goal than the four zone system, the shots it did concede were much higher quality than the, the, the higher quality scoring opportunities than the, uh, the two zone system. Thank you very much for listening. All right, we will now bring Lori in uh, for question and answer with the judges. That was great. Um, Nikhil, do you, have a, do you have a preference in what order we're gonna go in? Go for it. Okay, I'll, I'll just jump in, but uh, other judges feel, feel free. Um, so first, um, that was terrific. That was, I mean, this is a really hard problem that you're working on and I like the approach that you've taken. Um, so, so let me let me ask just a couple of a couple of just clarifying questions, and then I'll ask some more some more sort of more general philosophical questions. So, when you're looking at the tracking data, you you had to define these um, the the target position, but presumably the players aren't so um, considerate as to just stop when they get to the target position. Presumably, they're jiggling around. So, how do you define the end of a tra trajectory? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, <clears throat> our definition, like a formal definition in the uh, in the analysis, was to to look at their positions um, one second after the first ball interaction following the corner, um, or after two seconds after the corner was taken. Whatever occurred, whatever occurred first. And the reason why it was one second after the first ball interaction is is sometimes you can see teams try to get a player that flicks the yeah. ball on so that another player can reach it. So we wanted to be able to track their trajectory to the end of there. Um, of course, we don't really know, you know exactly where they were aiming to get to, and some players might get blocked or unable to get there. So we, we simply assume that they do reach their target trajectory. I see. Target okay. Position. Terrific. And and I, I love that you use the Gaussian mixtures for that. Um, did, um, and so you said uh, that you, uh, you, I think you picked 15 can, can cover the sort of the, the space. Um, what what was the metric you used to decide how many how many Gaussians you need to take to fit the data? Yeah, so we're looking at the um, the log loss, the total log loss of the um, of the the full model, and then assuming there's five degrees of freedom for each component that's added. Um, yeah. I think the, the exact criterion was there had to be a change in a delta log likelihood of ten in order to justify adding a new component. I see. Okay, great. Um, okay, I'm, a, I'm just going to, I'm going to do two more quick things and then I'm going to let the others jump in. So, um, so first, um, so, so you, so once you've got these, these mixtures, you now have this list of features by which you can classify things. Um, so ha have you done some kind of a principal component analysis to understand? To, so two things I have, I have questions about the features. One is, which are the features that are most likely um, to be effective, i.e. most likely to get lead to a goal? And the second is which are the features that are most distinctive? So if you could only tell me two of the features and, and then you had to tell me to add from that to predict which team that was, which are the ones that are most likely to tell you to be associated with, with different teams? Um, yeah, would you mind if I shared my screen? Sure, I, sure. <laughs> Nikhil, is that okay? <laughs> yep. yep, go for it. Um, so yeah, I have the slides here. Um, so just sort of taking us to the, uh, the features. 
okay, well, we can look at it here. Um, I mean, I think the the sort of the major feature of interest, the one that kind of occurs the most frequently is this one here, um, because there is a strategy of, of players that, you know, a strategy that many teams use of sort of grouping players some distance from the goal um, such that they can kind of meet an incoming ball at, at pace so they're running quite quickly, um, presumably to help them evade their, um, their markers as well. Um, and then sort of one of the other sort of very commonly occurring uh, features that you see is, is this kind of thing here where you have a player that sort of starts near the, the goal mouth and tries to run out to intercept that, um, intercept the sort of the incoming ball, assuming that the corner always comes from the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of your question regarding um, which features are, are most likely to produce goals, um, this, this is kind of, I mean, ultimately one of the main ambitions of all this work was to try to understand what works best, like how do you increase productivity? Mm -hmm. um, the reason why we didn't explicitly explore that in this work is that the data is based on, in, in total, from two seasons of the same league, um, which means that many of the same teams are reoccurring. Mm -hmm. and. I concluded there's a, a strong risk of being confounded by simply how good the team was um, when doing that analysis and, and effectively came to the conclusion that we need more, um, more data from more distinct teams so that you can separate, you know, what is strategy and what is, you know, just having teams, players who are very tall and very good at heading the ball mm -hmm. um, and separate those two things. So we sort of specifically didn't look at that. Mm -hmm. Got it. Cool. And then I, I'm, my last thing is I'm just going to make a, um, a quick, quick su suggestion. So in your, um, in your defense where you were de determining who was uh, doing zone and who was doing man. So we've looked at some of that um, in basketball. And by the way, you shouldn't know about this at all. We haven't published it. So, so, sorry. Um, so I'm giving this to you as a tip. Um, so what we looked at is we looked at acceleration correlations. So we just took the acceleration of, of different players. We computed the correlation function. And if somebody, because acceleration will tell you if you're tracking. And so, so if you look at the correlation function, there's always a delay. So you can pick out both the delay and you can find who is maximally correlated. And um, it's actually not a bad way to figure out if you're tracking someone or if you're playing zones. So it might be an interesting comparison to see if you can get something similar and it's and it's a super cheap calculation right because it i mean it really is just compute the correlation function of everybody to everybody that's really interesting i mean and and um you know i've been looking for ways to add more trajectory information into this and um so yeah i'll definitely look into that thanks very much yeah. great okay i'll pass on to the other judges uh, i can keep I'll talking but I'll let somebody else go <laughs> i look forward to seeing that uh research uh, about basketball okay the uh, uh how confident are you if, if I understand your research correctly, the less commonly used strategy was the more successful strategy. Um, I'm not sure I would say less commonly used. Um, I mean, it was less commonly used in, in the data that we looked at, but we've noticed increasingly, and especially talking to coaches, um, teams moving to this sort of four or five uh, person zonal system. Um, so I, I, I don't, I, I think perhaps it's uh, become growing in popularity. But that gets to the other question I was going to ask, which is how confident are you? Well, first of all, how confident are you that, that's, that that is generally true as opposed to merely true in your study? And is it possible that the less commonly used strategy was more successful because it is less commonly used? So, so your question is basically teams weren't quite prepared for that type of um, system and therefore didn't design kind of strategies for, uh, for, for dealing with it. Um, is, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's, that's the second question. What I wanted to ask first is, is how confident are you that that's generally true as opposed to true in your study? I mean, I think I'd need to look at data for um, for, for other leagues, really, to be able right. to make that statement. I mean, you know, to That's be fine. precise, it's really the statement is correct for the league that we looked at. Right. Okay. Um, so for your, your second question, um, which remind me, sorry, what was the second question again? Uh, is, it, is it possible that it was simply more effective because it was being used less? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is possible. Um, I mean, we try to sort of think about why, what is going on in that system. Um, so talking to, I mean, talking to kind of domain experts, coaches and so on, what they typically say is that 
oh, when a team when a when a team sees a lot of defenders positioned quite close to goal in that zonal configuration, they may they will often aim the corner kicks basically further out um, because there'll be tend to be more unmarked players or players are more likely to be free further from the goal mouth. Yeah. Um, I think the success of that system is really that it kind of pushes pushes the shots away from goal a little bit, but concedes more. Um, in the end, that seems to work out um, in the favor of the team of the of the zonally marking um, team. Um, but of course, you know we also need more data to to be absolutely sure of that. Yeah. Yeah. Let us suppose that uh, let us suppose that the norm for successful kicks is two percent. The uh, if you can move that to three percent. While the other teams don't move it for three percent, how much does that increase your winning percentage? What's the impact on on the uh, team's winning percentage? Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of the calculation I have to do in my head. Um, so two percent is one goal every uh, every 50, 50 corners, which is approximately um, one goal every ten games. Um, in the example I gave with Michelin, when they moved it up to five percent, that's one goal in every every four games. So just kind of to use that example, because it's the one that's in my head rather than the 3%. The, um, um, so 5% of corners converted gives you about nine goals per season um, versus three or four goals per season if they, at, the, at the base rate. And that you know, in a low, scoring, a low scoring sport like soccer, five or six goals you know, can quite frequently be the, um, the difference between relegation and, and survival in a given league. Um, most teams score about one goal, gain about a point per goal. So five or five or six goals is you know is worth five or six points, um, which is often a significant difference between qualifying for international tournaments or you know avoiding relegation. Sure. The, and uh, is this work that you've done potentially a more more, more value to uh, coaches? Or I mean, I, I my reading it's valuable to coaches. Uh, and could be quite valuable to coaches, but is it is it something that is only impactful if the players understand it, or is it impactful uh, even if if the players are, are simply following orders? I mean, I, I think with most strategy, it's the players have to kind of, to a degree, follow orders. Um, they have to execute a strategy. And if a strategy requires several players to run in one direction to create an opening for a third, fourth player, it, you know, if anything doesn't happen in that system, the strategy might simply may not be successful. I mean, one thing that I will say is that we tried very hard to design all this work in a way that could be easily discussed and explained with, with coaches and players sort of to try to make it very visual in the way that we imagine runs, um, you know, even the sort of one of the, I think one of the successes as far as I was concerned is the way that the zones that we find from our Gaussian mixture models match often the way that coaches design these zones when designing set pieces um, themselves without sort of being driven by the data. So there's kind of a lot of overlap in terms of the way that we've constructed the model and, and the way that, coaches and, uh, and video analysts and so on design their strategies. Um, the one other thing I'd like to add to that is that, you know, another major piece of this work was that I found a quote from, um, from a very elite manager um, who stated that, you know, most video analysts kind of look back the last five games when they try to scout an opponent to see what they did in set piece situations. Um, but, you know, five games is not very much. Um, what we find in our data is that teams will sometimes use a routine regularly then cease to use it for 10, 15 games and bring it back. Um, so what we wanted is the tools that enabled you to analyze to the same degree of depth um, a much larger number of name, uh, games to, to really characterize what teams are doing in set piece situations. Here we worked on corners, but we would have liked, you know, we ultimately want to expand that to, to all set pieces, not just corner kicks. Corner kicks seem like the easiest place to start. Yeah, and right. And I didn't want to imply that it was a, a, a failure of the study if you couldn't be certain that it was generally true as opposed to true within your study. I mean, you, you have to you can establish it's true within the study. That's that's important in itself and, and, and enables you to put the next foot forward. So thank you very much for your excellent research. I'll turn, let Jeff get in. Thank you. Jeff, you're on mute if you want to just unmute really quickly. 
double muted myself, keyboard and the button. Um, so I'm almost out of time. So I'm gonna try to ask, maybe ask one question. Did you use expected goals in like the background of any of your, your analysis, or is it really more binary if you know shot taken and goal result? Just a quality of touch. Um, no, we didn't use expected goals. Um, the, the sort of excuse the pun. The goal was to is to to build a, an expected goals model that is specifically designed for for corner kicks. Um, uh, again, you know, it's just something that we wanted more data. So it's a binary kind of was there a shot or not? Did that shot produce a goal or not? All right, I, I'm good. Thank you. Can I ask one quick follow-up? I know we're way over. <laughs> it's just, it's just and Bill made me think of this. So, just, um, so, so, it, so it looks like sort of the trade in those two examples you showed, where you had four guys in the goal versus two guys in the goal. It looks like the trade-off you're making is where do you put your guys? Right? Do you put them far away so it's harder to take a shot? Um, but then you have fewer people in the goal to defend against that shot, or do you put them in the goal so it's easier to take the shot? But um, uh, but you have more people to defend against it. So, so this is sort of a resource allocation question you're, you're asking, right? Is it like, is it, is it better to put the guys in the goal, let them take the shot, but then stop it versus um, uh, make it hard for them to take the shot, but then have fewer guys in the goal to stop, to stop it. Is that the trade-off you're showing in this slide? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, I think uh, exactly. I think it's sort of the sense that the more zonal players you have, the less, the fewer players essentially you have to kind of, allocate to individual opponents um, yeah. at the trade-off of sort of protecting a certain region. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think that is exactly the trend you see is it kind of pushes it further out, but risks um, more shots on goal. I think maybe the one other advantage of the four zone system is it kind of creates more of a space for, for the goalkeeper mm. to dominate a little mm -hmm. bit. And so I sort of also wonder whether it, it also provides protection essentially for the goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed now that uh, when we were watching your full presentation, uh, I couldn't see part of your of your zonal system. I see I misinterpreted some of the chart because I, I didn't see it until now. Any other guys had that problem? It's just just my screen. You didn't have it. Oh, I think I saw it, but uh... I wasn't seeing the whole. I wasn't yeah, seeing the whole thing during the previous part. All right, as always, great questions from the judges. Uh, in the spirit of time, we will conclude the first presentation with Lori, and we will now move on to uh, Andrew Patton, Matt Scott, and Nathan Walker talking about predicting NBA talent from college tracking data. Thank you, Lori, and we will now bring in Thank Andrew. you very much. Thank you. Do you want me to go now? Ah, uh, yes, please. <laughs> Thanks, Lori. Thanks. All right, we will now roll Andrew's presentation and then jump into Q&A with the judges. Hey, Nikhil, do you want me on video while they do that? My name's Matt Scott, and I'm a data scientist at Stats Perform. You can stay I'm off, joined thanks. here by one of my co-authors, Nathan Walker. And the purpose of our paper is predicting NBA performance based on college basketball tracking. So we're going to start off by talking a little bit about the history of tracking data. So here at Stats Perform, we had our SportView systems installed in a handful of venues back in 2010. That expanded to be league-wide at the start of the 2013-14 season. I started the company a few months before that, and as you can probably imagine, that was a massive undertaking. So if we want to tell the story of what happens in a game, we want our data to be as detailed as possible, and that requires tracking data. And in terms of full game coverage, before tracking data came along, the best we could really do is play by play. But now with cameras installed in all 29 NBA venues, we have that same level of coverage for tracking data as well. This data doesn't really exist for college. We've had sport view systems installed in a number of college venues, but nowhere close to the entirety of the league. And because we're missing so much data, we can't really use it to make predictions. And the challenges of an in-venue solution are one, it's hard to scale, we need systems in 350 plus venues. And two, we can't go back in time. Even if we installed tracking cameras in every single college venue tomorrow, we wouldn't really be able to use it to make predictions because we wouldn't have any historical data to model. So when it comes to using college tracking data to predict MBA success, we can't really do anything because we all have the data until now. Autostat solves this problem. We're able to get tracking data from broadcast video. So we don't need any cameras in venue. And because we have archival broadcast video, we can go back in time. So this is huge. 
We're able to get the same tracking data we have for college for the MBA with nothing required in venue and we can go back historically. We could spend hours talking about how Autostats works, but in the interest of time and because it's not the purpose of this paper, I'm not gonna do that. We will have a link with more information at the end of this presentation. So now that we have the raw, dra raw tracking data, what can we do with it? Well, what you'll see here is the raw tracking data on the left and the corresponding events derived from the tracking and play-by-play -play on the right. These events are created automatically using machine learning models with uh, precision and recall rates above 0.8 and 0.7 respectively. And this is comparable to an in-venue solution. So with the tracking video on the left, the red dots represent the offensive players, blue or defense, gray is the ball slash ball handler, and the lines connecting the players are the defensive map. Some of the biggest gains we get from tracking data come on the defensive side of the ball. You know, with box score data, we're really just limited to things like steals and blocks. But we have this really cool tracking metric called defensive influence score, which is really a measure of defensive intensity. And that allows us to determine things like these defensive matchups, but also ball screen coverages, whether or not a shot's contested, et cetera. Okay, so we've tracked over 650,000 possessions of college basketball across 300 million frames. So what? What can we do with the data? Well, one, we can use it to provide detailed player reports. This example here is for PJ Washington, and it's a subset of all the events, offensive events we have for him. We zoom in on shots. We can see things like off dribble and catch and shoot field goal percentage, contested and uncontested field goal percentage, how contested his shots are on average based on that influence score metric, and also what his expected effective field goal percentages are. We zoom back out and then zoom in on picks. We can see the frequency of the event and also player and team efficiency metrics. And we have these metrics for both the ball, when he's the ball handler and the screener. We can do it on the defensive side as well. Um, that's true of all of our events. And these metrics was just a subset of what we can do with each of these events. And now that we have this differentiated data, we can use it to provide better college to MBA predictions. And I will hand it over to Nathan who will explain how we do that. Thanks, Matt. So the two predictions we make for these players are, will you make the NBA and what draft pick range do you belong in? And before diving into how we make these predictions, we'd like to show off the outputs. Zion Williamson was, of course, a no-brainer pick for everyone, including our models. We predicted he had a very high chance of making the NBA and being a top draft pick. You can also see on the left some feature groupings for possible strengths and weaknesses for players, which we'll dive into more in a minute. Let's look at another recently drafted player. Here's our model outputs for Sam Merrill, who we predicted to be a mid second rounder, but was actually picked 60th in 2020. You can also see his strengths are a bit lower than Zion's, especially for creation, which is likely due to his strength relative to position in college. So how do we make these predictions? Obviously we start with tracking data and end up with model predictions as our output, but what makes up the model's feature representation? We start with rich tracking features. With auto stats, we have features that fall under defensive efficiency, like points per touch allowed on drives, rebounding numbers not found in the box score, like percent of available rebounds boxed out on, passing features like percent of passes, which led to a shot, and transition features like points per transition touch. Since we have hundreds of possible data points and very few players each season make the NBA, careful work is done to prevent model, model overfitting. First, we implement what's known as the padding method, which takes all our features and regresses them towards a league average mean based on number of attempts or possessions played. We use both the raw data and the mean regressed or padded data as two separate models. From that, we create more robust predictions by ensembling their outputs in our final classification model. Specifically for our will you make the MBA model, we classify whether or not each player makes the MBA with light GBM, a gradient boosting model. Importantly, we compared a model which uses our tracking data to one without. Ours saw a 20% improvement in error versus using box score and demographic features alone. Predictions aren't the only output we can get from this model, however. We can also use interpretable machine learning techniques to evaluate possible reasons someone might be seen as an NBA player. The red and blue charts here represent SHAP value or Shapley values, which is an approach to explaining machine learning model outputs. You can see in the chart that Shapley gives positive and negative credit to subsets of features in our model. Fred Van Vliet's Shap chart is shown here. As you can see in the demographics bucket, our model predicts his age would lower his likelihood of making the MBA. 
but we predicted he also had a good chance of overcoming that and becoming an NBA player thanks to his other helpful attributes. The next set of predictions we make is what draft pick range do you belong in? To improve the model outputs, we first assigned a regression target to each draft pick by measuring the average box plus minus VORP for the first five years of a player's career and smoothing that line. For those unfamiliar with VORP, feel free to follow the URL on this slide for more information. As you can see, the number one pick is significantly more valuable than number two, and there's a steep slope afterwards. This also aligns with how draft models should be evaluated, as missing on the number one pick can be damaging to a franchise, but missing on the 60th pick is far less significant. Since this output is not a known parametric distribution, we made our final output a classification target using Jenks' natural breaks algorithm to come up with sensible pick ranges, such as pick number one through two, three through five, six through eight, and so on. Here's the full architecture diagram for the classification model, which includes raw and padded data, and our regression target at the bottom. We also included the make NBA probabilities from our first model as a feature, which improved prediction accuracy. So here are the model results for top players in the 2019 and 2020 draft classes. Players whose distribution is skewed more to the left, our model predicts will be a higher draft pick and vice versa. As you can see, some players have more variation in their model predictions and some have less. So let's take a more granular look at two of these player predictions outside of the training sample, Tyler Hero and Isaac Okoro. You can see the model was highly confident in Tyler Hero's high pick value. While the model also felt Okoro was a mid-lottery pick, his predicted distribution of outcomes was much wider. There are a variety of possible reasons for this, but we think the model's increased confidence in Hero is likely due to his significantly stronger shooting attributes, such as uncontested three-point percentage and a higher volume of long-range attempts. To summarize, we are really just scratching the surface as we have a very large NCAA tracking data set. For more on this information, you can follow the Vimeo URL on this slide. We can also predict NBA talent and discern possible player strengths and weaknesses by using interpretable machine learning. Please note also, these predictions are the authors only and don't reflect any decisions made by NBA teams. Finally, potential future work includes increasing our data set by including historical data even further back, implementing leagues other than the NCAA, and predicting specific NBA data, such as player three-point percentage or usage. Thanks for listening. If you want more information on this, please read our paper. All right, we'll now jump into Q&A with the judges and Andrew. Are we going to get copies of these uh, presentations? Are you going to, I mean, uh, it's suggested we follow some links, but we don't have links in front of us anymore. Are we going to get copies of the presentation? Uh, not, not currently. Sorry about that, Bill. I, I, I'm, I'm going to, hey, hey, Nikhil, can you just send us all the link to how we get that tracking data? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that one to Andrew. Hey, oh, great. <laughs> I have two questions here, both of which are uh, kind of where the rubber beats the road type questions. And um, Daryl Morey and I had a season long mm -hmm. argument, all of the, all of Yudoka Azubuki's uh, senior season about where he was going to go in the draft. I was arguing that he was a low first round draft pick, and Daryl was arguing he was a mid second round draft pick. And as it turned out, I, I was right. He, so this is the only time I've ever been right on an argument with Daryl about basketball. So the um, uh, I, I will remember this forever and probably write about it many times. But uh, the uh, what uh, just for purpose of understanding your system better, where does your where does your system say that Yudoka falls? And if you know, or if you have it there, and uh, could you explain to me how your system reaches that particular conclusion? We don't actually have uh, Yudoka on this on this presentation, and I would have to go deep into the server to pull that out. So I don't have time to do that right now. Um, essentially, um, you know, but if he's not on this, then he tends to be, you know, we he's projected to be more of a late first, early second, if he's not in the top 14, obviously. Um, but we, with his information, we did create. It's just not uh, not in his presentation. And the other question I had, which is perhaps even more rubber smashing against the road than that one, is, and I don't know if you, this isn't a draft question, but all year, most of us, including myself, thought that Gonzaga was the better of the two great teams, right? 
That's what I thought. I thought Gonzaga was the best college basketball team I ever saw. The uh, in the champion after the championship game, we all understand that we were wrong about that and why we were wrong about that. I think. Would you agree with that statement or not? Um, regarding this season, <laughs> um, the, this model doesn't uh, you know didn't deal with the championship, the NCAA tournament in any way, shape, or form. As it was written before sure. then, obviously. Sure. Um, with regards to Gonzaga, I mean, I think that. You know, they, they, from what I saw, they were really good. Um, Baylor just happened to play great. And, you know, it was, it was a really entertaining game. I'm not sure. Well, I wouldn't agree with that. It, no, I, I would not agree with that. The, uh, it's not just that Baylor played great. Baylor is a better team. And I think you could use your data to show what their advantages were that we missed all year. Uh, Baylor was much more, and I was fascinated by the part where you link together the defender and the, and the, um, and the offense certainly I mean, we could use this data to per build team level models for you know right. essentially team so that, level models this is individual player only well, i know that but I, I was asking if uh, the the two great baylor guards had advantages in a high level competition that weren't really that obvious when they when they were both just beating the hell out of some lesser team uh so i i i think that that your data probably could be used to reveal those advantages at a more reliable level. So, you know, I would hope that that's true. And I believe that it's true. Yeah. I mean, I think that if you look at as uh, when Matt on the presentation talked about the influence score, essentially the, the measure of how much, how hard you're guarded and how hard you guard is a very, very strong, you know, if you to have essentially only build a model on one variable, that would be it. Um, because it is, is a very powerful predictor of likelihood of making the NBA and, and likelihood of being a higher draft pick in the NBA. So yeah, you're definitely correct in that regard. Thank you, sir. Jeff, do you want to go next or do you want me to go? Sure. Um, so Andrew, it looks like you said 650,000 possessions. How many, is that like 4,000 games? What was, what's that actually translate to? It's slightly more than that. Um, we can't get into the exact specifics, Due to some client confidentiality, but it is you are you have the right number of zeros, that's for sure. Okay, and are you so obviously there's like 31, 32 conferences. Um, like how far back are you you're doing broadcast data? Like what's the sample you're using to, to train the system? Um, and you know how many you're looking at all you know players can come in from any conference, but majority of the players come from like. 10 conferences. So are you looking at 10 conferences, looking at 30 conferences? You going, I'm trying to get the dimension of how far you're going back in the, in the scope of what you're doing. Yeah. So some of we can't, again, can't say the exact games and uh, parameters of which, like which games exactly we picked. Um, I will say that, you know, you know, obviously if you're looking for NBA talent, you're going to be focusing on, you know, the ACC and the big 10 and all that more than you're going to be focusing on a, on a, you know, a division three conference, right? I think that's somewhat self-evident. So we can't run every single game in college ever done. So there is more of a focus on with the, the a priori of that, you know, power conferences tend to have better players than most of the NBA. So yeah, there is some certainly unavoidable um, bias there a little bit. Okay, so for a follow-up question, are you, with confident, like, are you getting like a hundred percent of Duke games for Zion and Barrett? I mean, I guess I'm trying to continue you know, these statistics are representative of like, you know, the stats, see all the games, like the box levels have all the stats, right? So is your auto stats a complete log of the player's time in college, or is it like a sample of the player's time in college? Um, it depends on the player. And it... you could imagine that you know, plays Duke and you, early in, early in the, um, early in the season as a mid-major or a minor team, you may only have one game in auto stats. Um, if you're one of the power teams or the big conferences, uh, we try and cover as many as we can. So you're basing projections on some people with very small sample of data and others with much larger samples. Is that fair to say? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And part of that is that the, the, when we apply the padding and the raw, we have those two data sets, right? The idea that if you play one game in auto stats, your raw statistics are what they are, but your padded statistics are going to be incredibly regressed. Conversely, if, you, if we have four years and you played 30 games a year and 30 minutes a game, your raw and padded will be much closer to each other. Great. 
Okay, so um, I guess I'll jump in. Um, so first I have to tell you, I have a giant smiley face in my notes next to tracking data from college games. So I'm super excited about that. Um, so it's like, if we could get our hands on that, amazing. Um, okay, so my, my questions uh, sort of center around, um, you, when you make the predictions, you don't make them directly from the tracking data, right? You first have to turn the tracking data into some kind of features, right? So there's, there's a, yes, absolutely. Right? So, that, so there's a step where there's a, there's, there's one magic step where you turn into features and then you have to do the machine learning about how that, okay. So my first is I'm going to ask about the feature step, the turning into feature step. So, uh, so I'm just going to pick one which, which I know has been um, contentious. So when you, and this is from my experience with the second spectrum data, so the second spectrum data also labels shots that are contested and uncontested or, or gives them a grade of how contested it is. Mm -hmm. um, and in talking to the NBA teams, what I've heard is that it's terrible. So, um, so can you give me, um, just dig a little bit into the weeds and tell me how do you do your analysis to determine which shots are contested and which are uncontested? Sure, let me share my screen. I think that'll be a little easier. I can show you a slide. So can everyone see this uh, this 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 uh, this slide? Yep. So essentially, this the lines here are our influence score. How the proximity of player to player and who you are guarding and who is being guarded by. Mm -hmm. That's the basis for our contested definition. And again, how you determine contested <laughs> is dependent on the data provider. And you know, if you ask a coach and a player and an analyst, they may have different answers. Mm -hmm. um, but the Essentially, we use a sliding scale of how far are you from the player. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we don't have pose yet. So if your hand is down versus mm -hmm. your hand up, that, that matters. And I don't think anyone has that yet. But mm -hmm. we use this influence score as a kind of a foundational feature for kind of calculating out some other features like that. So it's mo so this is mostly determined then by distance and maybe angle to the basket. It's not that you had a bunch of people watch the videos, label this as a contested shot, and then have a have a labeled data set that you could train on. Correct. Yeah, this is based on uh, proximity and angles and and lanes. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. Um, and then okay. So so um, so my next question is so so I so I figure out contested and contested defensive intensity, all of these fantastic metrics you've got. Um, so now when you're training on draft, is it just, I just want to clarify, are you, are you, is your, um, is your training set based on when they were actually drafted or is your training set based on performance in the NBA in the subsequent year? So are you, are you looking, are you predicting when they will be drafted or are you predicting how well they're going to perform? So this model essentially ends at the day they get, the, the minute they get drafted, this model ends. And it's important to note that the model isn't when they should get drafted. It is in a context-free environment where this player kind of profiles in the spot. Obviously, if you're a team that has eight point guards and the first and the number the best rated players another point guard, maybe you're not going to take him. <laughs> so the idea, so it's a you know, we made that clear because obviously there's so many contextual factors about you know if you just read a mock draft from a connected writer, they're going to have a much more accurate time because right. they asked the GM and they said we're taking this person. Right, exactly. Okay, I see. So this is so. In fact, this is this is um, the prediction here is um, uh, based on historical the the sort of the the his, historical order of the draft. What is the likely order of the draft that's going to happen? Not who is who is likely to outperform their draft position. Correct. There is no indication of NBA performance at all. Essentially, saying this player, based on all past previous drafts, profiles like somebody who gets picked between 12 and 18. Okay, great. And great. also the, one of the best parts about that is that it's used to uh, compare draft classes across years because there's no, con there's no team level and draft specific context. Mm -hmm. You can look at one draft and say, oh, were there a lot of these players that are profiling in the, in the early lottery, but they obviously all can't get picked then. But then the next year you say, oh, a lot of these players are kind of profiling in the mid of the back. So maybe there's less talent here than we've thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what, which of your features are most likely to be uh, highly correlated with draft position? Uh, the, uh, the two of them, uh, they are influence score. So literally this distance, because if you're a good player, somebody's going to try and stick with you. And if you're a good player, you're sticking to somebody. And then gravity, which is a stat uh, I created, actually, it's in the public space. That is essentially a spatially weighted measure of usage and efficiency. So 
spatially weighted. In, you know, in some respects, okay. it uses X Y locations of shots. Uh -huh. um, that's been kind of uh, deconstructed down to uh, a few variables, and then um, those two primarily, and then we have uh, transition indicators, yeah. which we think are very good proxies for athleticism. I see. I see. Inter okay, so I'm mean, just spatially weighted transition efficiency. So you basically have a map of the court that says if I'm if I'm standing in in this area, on average, people will be will shoot with with this uh, fraction likely to go in, and I just want to know if I'm above or below that average. It is uh, not quite that. Essentially, it says uh, the gravity is essentially um, a combin like uh, it's essentially a combination of an, of a model that looks at how accurate you are to your points per shot and your yeah. usage from a given location, because a, given location. a player who shoots 40%, but only takes one, three a game is not okay. as good as a player who shoots 37% at 15 a game. Okay. So it, it takes into account the fact that there is a usage and efficiency trade-off that, that matters. Got it. Got it. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Is there anything in, in your data that uh, gives us a sense of the player's uh, intuitive basketball IQ I mean, I agree with you that this stuff about tracking the distance from the defender, from the uh, offensive player is hugely important and quite valuable. But what, what makes defenses fail is bad switches an awful lot of the time. So is there, is there some way you can look at this and say, all right, this guy uh, knows what he should do when he's forced to make a switch and this guy doesn't have a clue? Or uh, are you still what I'm, what I'm asking you? Yep, absolutely. We look at essentially, you can look at pick and roll coverages and successful and points out of those possessions and then understand where players go based on, uh, you know, if the ball handler goes left here, wh where do they go? If they take the screen or go under the screen or over the screen. Um, one we've also used essentially is, because uh, obviously in college, the skill level between all of the players in the court is pretty disparate. So right. you can have, for example, for point guards, number of open threes created. Um, that's, because that, that takes out of account the fact that their teammate, you know, is me and shoots 14% from three. And so there's the idea that you can understand what a player does while kind of abstracting out how good his teammates are to get a sense of a player's actual projectable abilities. Thank you. All right. Thank you, judges, for all of those questions and Andrew for uh, answering them. We will now move on to the third presentation within the finals, and this will be from Alex Williams, an undergraduate from Ohio State that will be presenting on Mayfield using machine learning uh, to predict football data. And I will now... Uh, if you guys want access to the or have questions about the underlying data, uh, get in touch with Patrick Lucy, Patrick. and he will be able to... He's the person who you can uh, inquire about that. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, we now have Alex and we will uh, begin his presentation and then go to Q&A with judges. Thank you for attending our presentation. We're excited to share all about Mayfield and what it has to offer with you today. But first, let me introduce myself and the Mayfield team. I'm Alexander Williams, an undergraduate at Ohio State and I'm the project lead for Mayfield. Now I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves. Hey. I'm Seth Brugler, a software developer for General Motors in Austin, Texas. And hi, Team Ken Clark, a graduate student at Ohio State and software developer for Liberty Mutual. So what is Mayfield? Simply put, it's a machine learning algorithm for yearly forecasting indicators and estimation of long run player development. Conveniently, it's also the name of Seth's favorite quarterback. The idea is that we've created an algorithm to predict season statistics for any NFL player. So we want an algorithm that will accurately predict player and team performance. This is a big opportunity in the NFL as there currently isn't a comprehensive forecasting system like we created Mayfield to be. Most models are only for certain positions and still aren't very accurate. And the models that do exist are kept pretty secret blocking analytical progress. So with Mayfield, we hope to start solving these issues. We want Mayfield to be state of the art to be as general as possible and to make our methods public so others can use Mayfield to advance analytics. And of course, we want it to be accurate. 
And now I'll hand it over to Alex to go into how we built Mayfield. Thanks, Ben. The principle behind Mayfield is called nearest neighbors, which is if two things behave similarly in the past, they'll behave similarly in the future. It's intuitive and powerful and used in many disciplines. K nearest neighbors in machine learning, similarity scores and sabermetrics, comparisons of amateur athletes to pros and scouting. versus the year we're adjusting for, times a deflator adjusting for the league being played in. Since McNabb's in the NFL here, it's one, but for his college data, that's where we'd make that adjustment. So we take five-year moving averages and we calculate a 2018 NFL equivalent for his 2005 passing yards. For more about these and our other calculations, check our paper on the conference website. So we do this type of translation for all of his on-field data. Mostly McNabb stats are only affected significantly by the league year factor, but for other players like kickers, the stadium factor will be more crucial. So after translating our player statistics, we need to find McNabb's nearest neighbors. So first we split player careers into segments, which are these overlapping chunks of a player's career. Using three year segments is best for quarterbacks. And here we're predicting one year into the future. These parameters can be changed though. Mayfield's very flexible in this regard. Uh, but anyways, there are just over 3,600 QB segment uh, seasons in our data, which filters down to a bit over 1,700 three-year segments. But we can still reduce things more to speed up our runtime. Uh, Locality-sensitive hashing quickly discards segments that weren't going to be a nearest neighbor. LSH slices the feature space into chunks, uh, assigns each a binary hash code, and the segments with hash codes too different from our player of interest, McNabb, get tossed out. With LSH, we can reduce the comparison pool by as much as two thirds. So next we quantify the similarity of player segments. Distance metrics are effectively just inverse similarity. So we can use them for this, but there are many different distance metrics to choose from. So some of the traits we look for in a distance metric are gonna be adjustment for the data's range and correlation between variables, robustness to outliers and allowance for feature weighting. Here's a 95% confidence region for several metrics. Uh, Euclidean, for instance, can't adjust for correlations or outliers. And the classical Mahalanobis does the former, but not the latter. And the source of this difference is the way the metrics use the covariance matrix. So with this in mind, we blended Schultz and Joaquin's learned weights Mahalanobis distance with a robust covariance matrix called MCD. Additionally, we encode qualitative data with a Jacquard index. So the matrix algebra will go something like this. We take the product of the raw distances an MCD matrix to control for variable scale and correlations, and a learned weighting matrix. And then to get similarity, we put that through a chi-square survival function. So here's McNabb's closest comps with similarity scores and the overall distribution of similarity. We see Hall of Famers like Aikman, Montana, and Elway, but also more average QBs like Flacco, Dalton, and Chubb. I think it's an interesting bunch overall. So then we regress on the K most similar segments, the nearest neighbors that we just saw. K can be changed, but 15 is best for QBs one year out. 
the coefficients and weights in this regression are learned the same way our weights matrix was. So we take the future performance of our nearest neighbors, weight it by similarity raised to an exponent, and put together, that's going to be a similarity weighted average of future performance. And we do a similar interpolation for a change in performance. Then we also have autoregressive terms for the player's past performance. And we plug all of these into our regression to get an initial prediction. But bias may creep into our regression for a few reasons. We may be selecting neighbors poorly, our interpolation may over-regress to the mean, or we might have predicted an impossible outcome like playing more than 16 games. So to fix these, we utilize LOAS, a non-parametric regression technique. Uh, for instance, we can see after about 30, uh, QB rush attempts are underestimated, but our correction puts them back in line with what you'd want. Uh, for instance, McNabb was predicted at 32 attempts, but after the correction, that's 36. So what does this mean for McNabb's 2008 season? Mayfield's predictions after retranslation to 2008 baselines are close to his actual statistics. Mayfield is slightly more pessimistic than his actual performance, but considering this is an excellent prediction. Then the final component is a CMAES optimizer we use to optimize our weighting and regression parameters. So we split into a training set of pre-2010 segments, minimize mean squared error, then cross-validate on a post-2010 sample. So overall, Mayfield is very accurate, especially at the most important position. There are some areas where it lags behind in high variance and out of position statistics, but these are difficult to predict regardless. Here are some tables with RMSEs for AV and quarterbacks, which gives us a basic idea of Mayfield's prediction accuracy. So to additionally evaluate Mayfield's effectiveness, we need to benchmark it against the industry standard. Football Outsiders graciously, graciously shared data with us on their algorithm, Kubiak, and Mayfield is more accurate in most cases we tested and is more consistent stat to stat. Uh, here are RMSEs for 2010 to 2017, D-linemen, edge rushers, and linebackers, Mayfield in red, Kubiak in blue, and we see Mayfield pulling ahead, which is consistent with the rest of the data. One final point, if Mayfield was accurate in sample, but the errors ballooned outside of that, Mayfield wouldn't be useful practically since overfitting or something like that would be going on. But when we investigate the data, here's an example for tight ends, we see very consistent RMSEs, and it's the same story for other positions as well. So we can be reasonably confident in Mayfield's predictive power going forward. Now I'll, go, I'll give it over to Seth to conclude. Thanks, Alex. So what sets Mayfield apart? Existing methods for predicting player performance are opaque, small in scope, and have limited accuracy. Mayfield improves by offering publicly available methods, unprecedented size and scope and application, and a high degree of flexibility, which combine to make Mayfield much more accurate. And looking forward for Mayfield, Mayfield was designed to scale as football analytics grows. Player tracking, play-by-play -play data, draft grades, injury history, contract information, all these things can be absorbed into Mayfield and boost accuracy without any algorithm modification. So I want to thank all of you for coming to hear more about Mayfield. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. At this time, we're happy to take any questions. And feel free to catch us on LinkedIn. Enjoy the rest of the conference. All right, we'll now jump into Q&A with Alex and the judges. Thanks, Scott. Can you guys talk a little bit about the, um, the college approximate value, how much, like, how you go about that, and then how much of a factor is that, especially for someone early in their career? Sure. So basically, our idea on the collegiate AV, uh, I believe Doug Drynan was the, the originator of, of course, uh, the NFL approximate value from Pro Football Reference. Uh, because we basically just, in terms of our data, we slot uh, the, we basically use the translated college data exactly as you would use the, the data directly from the NFL. We, will, we designed our AV for the college players to be basically exact, all as similar as we could make it to the professional AV. So there are some changes uh, that you, you have to make. For instance, game started data just simply isn't available for collegiate players or there isn't like in, uh, there isn't all pro or pro bowl play, uh, you know, players. So for in that sort of case, we used uh, all conference and all American. Uh, we thought that was, that was pretty, uh, pretty close, but basically in terms of the, the exact formulas we used, it is, I would say like 95% similar to the, uh, to, to what you, what you'd see for the NFL approximate value. How close are you guys to uh, getting a, one thing I loved about your uh, idea is that uh, it has many possible markets, right? Uh, 
and I appreciated the fact that you acknowledged that the limitation of the what's the in-house work in the NFL is that it is in-house and we never see it, so there's no evolution of the field of knowledge. I appreciated that. So how close are you guys to having something that uh, in the old days would have been in the newspaper, so to speak, so, and having something that's uh, accessible, uh, valuable, something that can be purchased, sold? Uh, what, what's your schedule? Yeah, I mean, we we uh, went about this from a totally academic standpoint uh, in terms of we don't really have like a, a business model or anything for right. for for Mayfield. But in terms of uh, in terms of the groundwork for uh, for using it and applying it, say, you know, we, I, there isn't exactly arbitration in the NFL. But in terms of if a player has a favorable projection, you know, working with them to use that to, to maybe to, to negotiate for a better contract or, uh, you know, on the flip side with with obviously NFL executives or something like that would be interested in this in terms of how far out we are from that. Um, I would say we're very, we're very, very close in terms of uh, being able to turn around and, and would use this on the ground, you know, on the ground floor sort of. Um, so you could basically establish a website tomorrow and start sharing this with us, you think? I mean, I, I, I couldn't really, I, I couldn't really say like specifically, but, but yeah, I, I would anticipate in the next, uh, you know, in the next few months, um, I'm still an undergraduate, so I'm just graduating here soon. But uh, you know, once once sort of that that madness ends, that uh, I would I would end up, and me and the, me and the team would get together and and start start publicizing this. Some, um, you know, set, setting up uh, data, uh, you know, and and instructions of of how to replicate all this and and you know, getting it out there. Um, I, I'll, I'll just i'll just jump in um the um so one question i had is so you have this fantastic data set that goes way back um but the game has changed over time like safety equipment has changed mm -hmm. and rules have changed and so um you know mcnab playing today might not be the same as mcnab playing in 1970 so do you do you weight more recent um time periods more heavily or do you find that that doesn't make a difference in your outcome yeah, so we do a couple things to try to control for that. One, uh, the major piece is obviously the NFL equivalencies, where we're sort of uh, taking a book from Sabermetric or taking a page out of the Sabermetrics book, so to speak, uh, in terms of, you know, Davenport translations have been around for about 20 years or so. Uh, in our own Bill James here, I think, was writing about it even, even longer ago than that. So, um, you know, this idea of trying to, trying to control for playing environment and not only between leagues, but but across time as well, has has been out there for for a while, and that's sort of something we were trying to bring in with uh, with Mayfield. But then, additionally, some of the our data set that we use, you know, it's not just on field data like we mentioned. There's contextual variables in terms of just even the year that was being played in is one of our variables. Mm -hmm. But not only that, also the the offensive scheme, defensive scheme uh, that was that was being played. The number, uh, for instance, uh, uh, one thing that's cited a lot in terms of the, the way the game's changed is passing happens a lot more. The uh, run-pass ratio is one of our contextual variables, um, that sort of thing. So it's sort of a two-pronged approach of, on the one hand, we have these, these other variables of, uh, that, that give some more context of what the sort of play style of the team was. Of maybe maybe the reason why you have so many passing yards is because your offense was just on the field a lot and had a lot of offensive plays. Or maybe it was because uh, in a case like for a kicker, if you're playing, say, in, in Detroit, where you're in a dome, then your, your field goal, you know, your field goal accuracy is going to be a little bit different than if you're playing in Green Bay and, and you're in the snow all the time. So and we would adjust for that with the NFL equivalencies. Um, it's, as far as how much of a difference it, it makes, um, it, it's, it's sort of hard to tell. Um, I would say there's. Overall, it's there's a much smaller impact there than something like uh, what we do with the Mahalanobis distance, where it adjusts for the variable correlations uh, just to each other. But there is, I would say, it's probably like five to eight percent mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, the adjustment for sort of the, the the scoring environment or just statistical environment, is what I would call it. Well. Uh, I deal with that problem all the time in baseball, and I know that if you use a really sophisticated um, similarity process, it will very rarely happen that a player shows as highly similar to a player from from 1922. I mean, that, we have to yeah. go all the way back, but most players are similar to their uh, to their contemporaries. 
Yes, that's something we certainly found as well. Um, just running the uh, just running the numbers, for instance, uh, like Patrick Mahomes only had his rookie year in our data set, but we ran the numbers just uh, just to see what what sort of what what it would sort of come up with, and we found all of his comparables were basically from uh, from two thousand and on. There were right. his top his top fifteen most similar players were. I think his earliest one was Peyton Manning's first three years. So, um, and that was 1999, 2000, 2001. And then I think Kurt Warner was in there as well. But uh, yeah, it, to Bill's point, absolutely. Um, it, it tends to be that, that the sort of nearest neighbor approach do, does it end up with exactly that. I see. I see. And by the way, good, good job calling out one of the judges. Nice work. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I got to cite my sources. <laughs> um, let me. I have one more question. So, so you mentioned um, that it's also predicting the number of games that the person will will start. So, is this something that is giving you an injury risk assessment as well? Uh, yeah, to some extent, it's it's hard to injury data isn't something that we have in there. Um, it's sort of just implicit in terms of if you're if you're closest if you're sort of most similar players are going are people who ended up getting injured down the line, then that's going to be factored into your uh, into your predicted statistics. So mm-hmm. back in uh, back in 2015, uh, when DeMarco Murray, for instance, was coming off like a 400 carry season, that's somebody who, who we would throw a red flag for. Of, oh, hey, this guy is probably, you know, looking at previous running backs who have had that this many carries in, in that short a period of time. This is somebody who is likely going to miss some games. Um, but on the other hand, it, it's it's still without the medical data there, and uh, it's it's sort of guesswork, you know. Like a so I mentioned Mahomes was somebody uh, somebody we mentioned. So some of his comparables, like I said, Kurt Warner ended up getting injured very very soon after that. Even though we we might not expect Patrick Mahomes to get injured very you know mm-hmm. soon necessarily. So it is uh, it, it is sort of some guesswork there. I would say. Um, one, one thing just additionally is that we wanted to have all of our data that we use for this come from public sources. If we were working directly with teams or had access to private data sets where medical data was something that we, you know, we could include in this algorithm very easily if we had access to that, then in that sort of case, I think uh, injuries would be something that, that Mayfield would be able to predict to, to a certain extent. I know there has been some work in baseball of, of injuries. You can, you, there, you can look at certain statistics like you know, just average velocity and see, oh, if, that, if that's dipping, they may be dealing with an injury that we just haven't heard about yet. And they, they may miss some time soon. So I think something similar would be definitely possible for football. Super interesting. And one, one just really, really last uh, quick one. So y- you, have, you have so many features in there. There's always the danger of overfitting when you have so many features. Have you, have you done some kind of a principal component analysis to figure out how many features you really need and what are the important ones in making the, the predictions? Yeah. So basically the, the way we go about that. So we didn't, uh, we didn't do any principal components analysis directly. What we did do to basically try to control for that was having that uh, learned, uh, the learned weighting matrix in our, in our distance, uh, in our distance metric, where if there were variables that weren't adding, basically we, we didn't, uh, it, unlike principal components analysis, we didn't really toss any variables straight up, but we would basically the, uh, the CMAS learning, uh, Mm. basically optima, optimization would downweight the variables that weren't very predictive. Um, so, so in that case, basically we would start every, we would start the matrix at just the identity matrix where each, uh, each variable is being weighted identically at one. But if, uh, if it turns out that cert, certain variables didn't end up being very, uh, uh, very predictive, then those would go much closer to zero. So, you know, sometimes even, even sometimes I think the lowest it got was around about uh, point, point 0.1, uh, mm-hmm. which is uh, going to be a lot lower. But um, in general, though, the 122 number of different variables, so that's across all different positions. So, for instance, uh, quarterback, uh, like tackles or mm-hmm. fumble recoveries or something like that, isn't going to be super important. And so we did, uh, we did sort of slice off variables for, for each, dependent on the position. So, uh, and we sort of describe that process in our paper. Basically, if it wasn't a stat that you would be immediately concerned about for for that position, then it was just it was thrown out of the data set for that particular position when we do the training. But for the 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 data that um, that was sort of relevant to that position, then it would it would go through that that weights process that that I described. 
I see. And you and you learn the weights by position. Yes. Yeah. So the training is done separately for each position. Yeah. Great. Alex, for stadium effects, is that similar? Did you like? I assume you mentioned kickers earlier. Um, mm -hmm. For sake, like offensive linemen. I don't think of stadium effects having much of an effect on an offensive lineman. Yeah, so we found that in general, um, stadium of, stadium effects tended to dominate for kickers and punters, uh, actually. But for for quarterbacks, for instance, they were within like uh, two percent thereabouts. So, in, in all honesty, that might be a case where for some positions we might just want to dis disregard stadium effects as just as just randomness. It was something that we wanted to include just for the most. Uh, you know, sort of generally applicable process as possible so that we weren't sort of having our finger on the button and say, and putting sort of a priori assumptions on it. But, uh, you know, going forward, yes, I, I agree with you. Something like offensive line stadium effects are not going to have a very large impact, but there are other positions where certainly they would. Great. Any last questions from the judges or are we all good? Thank you all very much. Nice job. All right. Man. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Alex. We will now move on to the last presentation of the day uh, by Julian Guillon on how groups of three in FIFA may lead to collusion. Thanks for joining my talk and thanks to the jury for selecting my work for the research paper competition. My name is uh, Julien Guillon. I'm a senior font at Bloomberg and an adjunct professor at Columbia and NYU. Uh, the research I want to present today is about the risk of collusion in sports competition. And more precisely, I will ask the question, will groups of three ruin the FIFA World Cup? So all the details of this uh, research are available in this uh, paper that was published in Journal of Sports Analytics uh, last year. I also published a much lighter version in the New York Times in June uh, 2018, just a few days before the start of the 2018 uh, World Cup. So we are talking about the soccer World Cup, right? FIFA World Cup, which is the most popular sporting event in the world with the uh, Olympics. It's organized every four years by FIFA. You can see here how the format has evolved over the years with more and more teams. FIFA plans to uh, have 48 teams in 2026. And most importantly for us, FIFA plans to use groups of three in the group stage instead of the traditional groups of four. So each group will play a, a single round robin tournament and the winner and runner up in each group will advance to the knockout stage. So let's call A, B and C the three teams. And most importantly, A will uh, be the team that plays the first two games, okay? And B and C, the two other teams. So of course there is a problem of scheduling balance, but there is a more serious issue, which is the subject of this talk. That's the risk of collusion. After match two, teams B and C, they will know what results of match three will let them uh, advance to the knockout stage. And we say that we have risk of collusion when a result lets them both advance at the expense of team A, which has already played their two games. So of course, this can badly harm the tournament and more globally the game of soccer, whether the match is actually fixed or not, because of course, uh, outcome uncertainty is at the very root of uh, sports popularity. So the most famous example in soccer is probably the disgrace of Rijon. Uh, during the 1982 World Cup, when West Germany beat Austria 1-0 and disqualified both teams at the expense of Algeria, who had played the day before. So West Germany scored quickly, and then the two teams refused to attack each other. You see here a picture of angry Algerian fans. So to prevent this to happen again, FIFA decided that all teams uh, must play their last group match at the same time. But of course, with groups of three, this is not possible. It's important to note that even in groups of four, even when teams play their last group game at the same time that does not fully prevent the risk of collusion and i'm giving here some example including one recent between france and denmark at the world cup 2018 so obviously fixed uh, to the sun and many people uh, and our goal here is to uh, 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 so of course the risk of collusion will be worse in groups of three and our goal is to precisely quantify the risk of uh, collusion and also quantify the impact of different things the match schedule the competitive balance and the point uh, system. And uh, we, we, I also suggested some alternate formats, depending on the time I will talk about them or not. The assumptions are the classical uh, 310 point system, at least at this stage. So three points for a win, one for a draw, zero for a loss. 
and using the classical tie-breaking rules. So RMF will denote the risk of match fixing, fixing or collusion. And we said that the RMF is aggravated when team B or C can win the group even after losing the last game. Okay, so that's with this uh, star, RMF star. So my research so, shows that the, we have a risk of match fixing exactly in the following cases. Team A, which is the team that plays the first two games, has one draw and one loss, or two draws, or one win and one loss, and a negative uh, goal difference. And for aggravated risk of collusion, uh, that's the third situation here uh, of one win and one loss, and this uh, situation for the goal uh, difference. Of course, if you put a probabilistic model on this, you can get the corresponding uh, probabilities. Okay, so PXY simply denotes the probability that team X beats uh, team Y, and so DXY is just the corresponding draw probability. So you see here the different situation, the different probabilities, and you, uh, we have identified previously the situations of collusion and aggravated collusion. And so that's uh, uh, on this uh, table here. And so when you have just summed the probabilities, you get the probability for risk of match fixing in a group of three or aggravated risk of match fixing in a group of three. Importantly, you, if you assume, for instance, perfect competitive balance. So all win probabilities are the same, equal to P. One minus two P is the corresponding draw probability. You get this formula here. And for a reasonable value of the win probability that corresponds to a draw probability of 25%, uh, the risk of collusion is actually larger than 42%, so very high. Um, we can, from this uh, result, uh, conclude that the probability of uh, risk of collusion is minimal, is maximum, sorry, and equal to one in the case where surely A <laughs> draws against B and A draws against C. And so that explains why FIFA has considered banning draws during the group stage. So a draw will actually end up with a penalty shootout with a winner and a loser. Uh, but actually forbidding draws does not eliminate the risk of uh, collusion because you still have the possibilities of A having one win and one loss. Uh, the priority, uh, uh, of uh, match fixing is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, in that case, minimum now uh, and equal to zero uh, if and only if basically those situations occur with the first two is when A is already qualified after the first two games and the second one corresponds to right, which is number three here, the, the situation where A surely is, surely is already eliminated after the first two games after losing against B and C. So that's quite clear that to minimize the probability of uh, collusion, team A should be the a priori strongest team in the group already qualified or the a priori weakest team in the group uh, if, uh, very, if very weak. And this is because we don't have just one group of three, but 16 of them. So the number of groups in which we have risk of collusion follows this binomial distribution and the probability that, that, that there is risk of collusion in at least one group are given by these simple uh, formulas. So let's look at the impact of different things, the schedule, the competitive balance, forbidding draws. So here I have three teams, strong one, middle one, weak one, okay, with the corresponding win probabilities. And you see that depending on who is A, the team that plays the first two games, so strong, middle, or weak, I represent the corresponding probabilities for the risk of collusion that you see here. So you see that clearly A should be the a priori strongest team in the group to minimize the risk of collusion. But you see that even in that case, the probability that there is a, at least one group with risk of collusion is above 90%, which is a lot. What's the impact of competitive balance? Uh, you see here, we consider perfect balance, the imbalance that we saw in the previous slide, and a strong imbalance, which are, if you want a very strong team, a middle team, and a very weak team. And you see that uh, in this situation, indeed, uh, in the case of strong imbalance, when A is the strongest team, then indeed that decreases the risk of collusion because it's more likely that A be already qualified. That also decreases the risk uh, of uh, collusion when A is the weaker team because it's likely that it's already uh, eliminated, but it increases it for the middle uh, team. But even in the most favorable case, you see that it's more than 60% chance that there is at least one group with risk of collusion. Let's now look at uh, the impact of the point system. So if we forbid draw, uh, the problem is that we, we create a new risk of match fixing on penalties when team B or C can win the group and eliminate team A even after drawing the last game and losing on penalties. So that means that B and C, they can agree on a draw and the team that leads in the rankings can at no expense decide to eliminate team A by losing the penalty shootout. And that's of course a situation that FIFA wants to avoid by all means. And actually you can do the same analysis for the risk of match fixing and aggravated risk of match fixing. You see here 3 0 is for this 3 0 point system. It's the same formula as before, except that now we have one half factors instead of one. So indeed, you decrease the risk of collusion, but actually you increase 
the risk of aggravated collusion. Okay, so forbidding draws and adopting the 3 point system always increases the probability of aggravated risk of, uh, of collusion. And that's the corresponding probabilities for the risk of collusion on penalties. Uh, so we see here the corresponding results. So 3 0 here is for the 3 0 point system. You see that indeed you decrease the risk of match fixing, but you actually increase the risk of aggravated match fixing and you create a new risk of match fixing on uh, penalties. So Ignacio Palacios Huerta, uh, who, had, uh, who is professor of economics at LSE, and he had read my the New York Times article, I guess, he said Julien Guignot, a mathematician, has pointed out that this raises the incentive for teams to collude. And he has suggested the 3 2 one, zero point system. I had also actually thought about it. But all this I do just on my spare time as a hobby. So this gave me extra motivation to do the computations in that case as well. And surprisingly, you will see here that actually when you move from the 3 zero to the 3 2 one, zero point system, you're actually uh, um, increasing the risk of uh, match fixing, which is uh, quite surprising. So these are the results, but uh, too many uh, tables with numbers. Let me show you graphs. So this is the probability of risk risk of match fixing in a given group in percent. So we consider three situations, perfect balance, imbalance in the middle, strong imbalance on the right. And in each case, we look at the situation where the strongest team is team A or the middle team or the weakest team. And we consider the three point system that I've mentioned, 310, 30, and 3210. And you see here that clearly the main uh, factor is the fact that the strongest team should be team A. So team A, the team that plays the first two games should be the strongest team. And you see that indeed, you decrease the risk of collusion when you forbid draws with the gray uh, lines here, but actually you increase the corresponding risk of aggravated risk of match fixing uh, that you see here. And you can see also that quite surprisingly, um, uh, actually the, uh, the 3 2 one, zero point system, even though it creates more scenario points, is, uh, creates more risk of match fixing that, uh, than the, uh, the, the 3 zero, uh, point system. And of course, in the 3 2 one, zero, uh, point system, you also uh, have this aggravated match fixing on penalties that you see here in yellow compared to the, uh, the aggravated one that I mentioned in the beginning, um, so the, just the, the, the star one. So to conclude, the most important factor impacting the risk of collusion is the schedule. So A should be the absolutely strongest team uh, in the group. Forbidding draws and adopting the 0 point system decreases the risk of collusion, but increases the probability of aggravated uh, collusion. And actually, surprisingly, compared to the 3 0 point system, uh, the RMF is slightly larger in the 3 2 1 uh, 0 uh, point uh, system. So I have no time for this, but I, in the paper, you can see some alternate 48 team format that decrease or, uh, or significantly decrease or even eradicate uh, the risk of, co of uh, collusion uh, that you see here and this table that compares the different uh, formats. And in my last slide, I want to mention that. Uh, the introduction of, uh, as a conclusion, that the introduction of groups of, of three is for me a terrible step back in the history of the World Cup because it makes the disgrace of Rihon possible again. But worse than that, it makes the risk of its repetition very high. And so that's why we have suggested alternate formats. And it's FIFA's responsibility to build a fair World Cup. So it's not too late for FIFA to review the format of the 2026 World Cup. And we really encourage the FIFA Council to realize the danger posed by those groups of three and uh, opt for one of the better formats that we have suggested. This is a list of uh, relevant references. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thanks, Julian. Uh, we now have Julian joining us uh, for Q&A with the judges. Hi, everyone. Re really interesting and appalling. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, Thank you. So uh, so I, um, let's see. Um, uh, so first of all, I'm going to tell FIFA. I don't know if you've already told FIFA. I'm sure you have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm actually, I am actually exchanging emails with the Deputy Secretary General in charge of football. So he, okay, good, he's, sure. he's aware. They're aware. <laughs> good, good. Um, so I need, I need, uh, I need to understand what the baseline is so I, I know how to normalize here. Uh -huh. So, um, so if you compare the, the probability of having a, a match where you're incentivized to collude, um, in, in the three-team form format versus the four-team format where the matches are not played simultaneously and the four-team format where the last match is played simultaneously. What, yeah. What's the rough uh, order of magnitude changes between those? You know what? That's, of course, a great question, and I really need to give a time on it, but I will be frank with you. Shame yeah. on me. I haven't done the numbers, and the reason is I actually just do this on my okay. spare time, my evenings and weekends. And I, I haven't found the time so far. So of course, it's it's it's. It, I should give you the numbers, and it's important to have those numbers to see exactly what's happening. But it's 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 very clear that 
it's going to be worse with groups of three, even though it's not zero with groups of four, even when the four teams play the last group game at the same time as, as, as we've seen because you know just in groups of three you have one of the three teams that just does not play <laughs> and so the two other teams that know exactly you know what results might be favorable for both of them and team a is just you know watching tv uh watching the game between b and c and that but but unfortunately i'm sorry about this it's i, I really should now do it because that's a very natural question and that you know that would indeed gives us information about how really worse is the situation with groups of three compared with groups of four. So actually one student of uh, Sunil Gulati, who I know who used, who used to be the president of US soccer for 12 years, I think, and was on the FIFA council. He's actually a colleague also at uh, Columbia. So one of his uh, students that have, have has, um, worked on the situation with groups of four, which is great. Unfortunately, I disagreed with some of, uh, um, on how, you know, she, 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 she made this work. And so I, she clearly overestimated the risk of collusion in groups of four when, when the 14 mm-hmm. plays at, at, at the same time, the last group game. So I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I can't rely on, on those numbers. Uh, it was like actually quite a good study. Huh? I mean, it's like, uh, it was quite good, but, but yeah, there were some things I, I disagreed and we discussed this and there was a time, but so I, I, you know, I, yeah, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't, fully trust those numbers and actually uh, they were like overestimated. I see. And then, and what, one follow-up. So, so in your, in your past slides, which went by like lightning, <laughs> um, well, uh, you mentioned that, that you have a scheme that will av- avoid collusion. So can you, can you give us like the, uh, like yeah. the five sentence overview of what that scheme is? Yeah. So I have actually uh, several. So I, I, I suggested actually, so uh, different formats. Okay. Where we keep for all of those formats, you keep 48 teams. Okay. So there are formats with groups of four. So mm-hmm. that would be, of course, 12 groups of four. <laughs> we don't have a choice when we have 48 teams and groups of four. 12 of them. And so either then, then of course, because 12 is not a power of two, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to qualify, of course, all the group winners, but maybe just some of the runners up. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you qualify all the runners up, but, and then you qualify a few of the third place team. So in order to have like, you know, a round of 16 or a round of 32. Uh, so that was for the first two uh, scenarios that I suggested, different formats. Uh, then I also suggested formats where you keep groups of three. for all. Yep. But now you actually, so either you just qualify the group winner. Of course, that, 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 that um, um, completely removes the, the risk of collusion because there's only one team qualified. But there's bad aspects about it. For instance, one team can be eliminated just after the first game, you know, if they, if they lose. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if, if they don't play the mm-hmm. second game and let's say team A has four points, then they're already eliminated, which is bad because if they're already eliminated, maybe they will not really play, you know, 100% the last game. And so team C, which is the third team, may actually benefit from this and actually, you know, be qualified, but not in a completely fair way. So it's mm-hmm. gonna, there's another position possibility where you keep groups of three and you qualify actually the, the, the three teams, all of them. But the group winner gets a buy. And mm-hmm. the number two and three, they will play a playoff, right? To be yeah. qualified for the, the round of uh, 32, say. Yeah. Um, so, that's, so that's good. But the, here, the bad aspect is that uh, um, team A, if, if it is the group winner, uh, may have actually, you know, so plays the first two games, then it doesn't play the third game on the third day. And then they will not play on the playoff because they get a bye. So it can be like a very long time before they play between yeah. two games. Not maybe so, so good. And then I have... Uh, suggested formats uh, where, okay, so also with groups of three, you keep just two, uh, the, the winner and the runner-up qualifying, but, but, but actually you will base the bracket on uh, group performance across groups. Hmm. So that means that, you know, you, the, the, let's say the, the best group winner will play a, a, a against the weaker runner-up based on group results across groups. Okay, so that's, that's something that I had suggested for the Euro 2016, and so that 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 decreases a lot the risk of uh, of collusion because of course you want to you know you want to be the best yeah. group winner, so you need to win even though you already qualified. Yeah. And um, then there are two other uh, formats that I think are very interesting. One is with eight groups of six. So groups of six, if you really play a full round robin, that would be too many too many games, right? You can yeah. actually do the competition; it will be 120 games just. Uh, for the for the group stage, that's that's way too too many games, uh, you know, for thirty two day uh, World Cup or maybe just a few days more, but like basically a World Cup that 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 is uh, only one one month long. And so what I suggested is actually you uh, 
and each each team in the, in a group of six only plays with three other teams, right? So let's say you would have two subgroups, subgroup one and subgroup two, and so each team in subgroup one play plays all the teams in subgroup two and 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 conversely. But in the end, you qualify the best two, for instance, say, but like you know globally, so the best two can come from subgroup one or from right. somewhere or from both of them, and and that decreases a lot the risk of collusion. And the last format that I suggested is actually uh, two group stages in a row. So you start with like indeed those. Uh, those uh, groups of three but actually the so you pair the group so for instance group a and group b would be paired and yeah. so the two teams that qualify from group a will join the two teams that qualify from group b in a second group stage so with four teams but you know the the, the results are carried over so the result yeah. let's say a1 versus a2 say uh, yeah. they don't play oh, again I mean, because you yeah. get yeah. and this of course also like in, incentivizes to win even if you're already qualified yeah. because you, you this result between the two teams in each group will carry over and will you know be um, very important for the, the qualification to the knockout phase yeah. so those are that the super so it sounds like there's two themes here so one is if you do something where winning a lot is better than just winning it's not a binary where you're either in or out it's how much you win matters so that's Absolutely. one way to avoid it yeah. And the other way is to frustrate the system a little bit. So I like what you said about it, 12 is not a power of two. So if you have something where the system is slightly frustrated and you're trying to get in not exactly the, the natural number, so you either have wildcard spots or you have bye weeks, then that also helps helps to mitigate against this. Absolutely. And that was actually already used in the FIFA World Cups, like from 86 yeah. to 24, because they had 24 teams and it was like uh, six groups of four. So six is not the power of two. So they all they also had to qualify some third place team, and that's actually the current system in the uh, European Championship. The, the Euro- really interesting. Yeah, well, there's a lot of dimensions to this, Julian. Though, as you said, right? There's the how many total games there are, and some of the formats you proposed had like added an extra week. And it's already a super short off season as it is right with club versus country and things like that. So I mean, okay. I just personally starred format six. I thought the eight groups of six, yes. the, the two subgroups. I, I kind of like that as far as the total days and the match. That's my but, favorite too. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, yeah. We've solved it. Yeah. <laughs> total, there's a total out of the box thought I had while reading the paper. Um, uh-huh. So the three, two, one, zero, but what instead this could cause other problems downstream. I have not done any math around this. Um, so how's that disclaimer? But what if instead of going to penalties, you still kept the draws, but draws that were had scores, you know, were, were worth two points. Uh-huh. Goalless draws were uh-huh. worth one. So at least I just think if one team scored, it may not re- have that collusion because it's kind of hard to give up a goal. I mean, yeah. you're fired that way. I just I just wonder if that would be something different that would change you know the, what? Yeah. the balance for a little bit. I haven't thought about it, and that's, I think it's a great idea actually. Yeah, indeed, to like to um, yeah um, um, reward teams like, who actually get you know the, the, the game ends in a draw. Okay, that's that happens, but it's of course somehow much better with one one two two because then it's not watch the, from a fan experience, right? It's entertainment too. You want to be fair. Yeah. It's also the world's biggest TV event, right? So if you have a one one or two two draw, you still get two points. Maybe yeah. I think that you can go, you get three draws and get six points rather than three points. And, but at and, least you're scoring goals in every game. There's nothing worse than zero zero. Yeah, exactly. And and you know what? That's also very interesting for the 2026 FIFA World Cup because it's going to be 48 teams, but that's not going to be the best 48 teams in the world, right? Because there's going to be probably like eight teams from Asia, nine from Africa, probably six from you know North America and the CONCACAF, what we call. And that's that, I mean that's already the case, you know, with with 32 teams. But so you you may have I mean no offense to anyone, but you may have groups like Brazil, Turkey, and Uganda. Or China, or I don't know, teams that we don't see today uh, at all in, in, in international competitions. And for those teams that are actually honestly like very weak, then maybe they will try to just play 0 0, right? Because you play against Brazil, you actually maybe just hope to end up in a 0 0. And in particular, if FIFA bans draws, then basically you have a 50 50 you know, chance of actually winning the penalty shootout and, and yeah. get like more points than Brazil. And so that would incentivize like really zero zero, but like you can't really play, you can't really try to play one one or two two, you know, if you're again, you, I mean, I don't, know, if you're a weak team versus Brazil or some other, uh, you know, powerhouse. So yeah, it's actually quite, quite interesting your suggestion. And the other thing is just you know the distribution and you just hit on it, but like um, in a sixteen group format, right? There aren't eight sixteen strong, sixteen middles, and sixteen weeks. Uh-huh. 
the, the, the best of the best and the 16th best aren't just because they're S's. Like there's a huge disparity in the power between Brazil and Argentina, whoever the 16th best team in the country, you know, the world is Serbia or something. So anyway, I just, there could be way more like middles than really S's and, and W's potentially based on how qualification goes. Yeah. No, I agree that this system where you actually, uh, uh, you know, decide the bracket based on the performance across groups, it actually works better when you have more games also, because here it's going to be just two games per team, you know, in the group stage. And uh, yeah, then, yeah, it might not be such an efficient system for this, but actually it's, uh, if you have like, for instance, like in the UFA Euro for now and in the World Cups between 86 and uh, 94, really the last one was in the US, um, you had these six groups of four, and you could have actually, so each team played three uh, games in the group stage, and it was a better, somehow a better way uh, uh, to build the, the, the bracket that, that, that you know, um, I mean, decreases the, clearly the risk of collusion or even the risk of, uh, of talking. Or, you know, for instance, in, at the Euro 2016, in that game, Italy was qualified and knew that he was qualified in first position just after the first two games. So they actually sent their B team for the last game, and actually they were beaten by Ireland, who actually then qualified. But so you can say it's not so fair because actually uh, Ireland didn't play the you know the A, A team of, uh, of Italy. So that's, and then that's the other part, the other side, is maybe chosen trying to win because they want to get a more favorable draw in the bracket side. So they're they are incentivized to always win. Also, if somehow there's upset on the other side where they're matched up, in yeah. Actually, I've also recently suggested another format which I think is extremely interesting which is choose your opponent. So that means the best group winner gets actually to choose who, mm. who's runner-up they actually, for instance, or, or any team, but for instance, if you say that they can only pick yeah. a runner-up, who, runner, who is the runner-up that they want to pick? Because maybe sometimes, you know, you're the best on paper, you're the best group winner, and you're supposed to go with the uh, weakest uh, runner-up, but maybe the weakest runner-up, you know, is not actually that weak, and uh, they just had like, you know, bad luck or not so good, or, or they are, prepared to actually be better later in later stages of the competition and i think it's actually a very interesting format i actually uh, yeah also published another paper on, on this and that could uh, really you know add an interesting um, strategic component to the to the competition yeah i could choose your opponent we have one minute left bill did you have anything that you wanted to add or a question yeah my question would be and i think i know the answer but i could be wrong why does soccer uniquely have this challenge? I mean, why why is it that soccer deals with this? Uh, what is it that football deals with this, whereas uh, other sports don't have the same problem to the same extent? So when you say this, you mean collusion? No, the problem with the um, uh, other teams... Well, here's what I was thinking. Uh, other sports are able to advance in a kind of metronomic system. We have two teams and one wins and the other one goes home. And they do that because uh, the enough points are scored in a game that uh, you're confident at the end of the game that the loser has had a fair chance. Uh -huh. uh, but when the scores are typically sticky, yeah. limited, low, then at the end of one can't really do that because uh, you're not confident that the better team has won. Is that absolutely. the answer? Ab absolutely. That's the thing with, with soccer. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so popular in the, in the, in the world. It's because the outcome has a lot of uncertainty and randomness in it, right? Because, you know, most of the games, they end up 0, zero 1, 0, you know, or maybe 1, 1, 2, 1. I mean, it's, it's a very, yeah. I mean, we, have a, like, we had like a nice example just a few days ago where we had a great game between Bayern Munich and Paris Saint-Germain, so that was actually the remake of the last final of the Champions League. And actually, Paris, I mean, to my great pleasure, actually won 3-2 there. But honestly, Bayern Munich like, had 31 shots okay, versus six for Paris Saint-Germain. And actually, Paris Saint-Germain won. And honestly, like, if you repeat this game 100 times, I mean, Bayern Munich will, will win, like, I don't know, maybe 70% you know, of the time, whatever. And so it's those very small scores that makes it not so easy. And for instance, yeah, you can't, you can't really do a pure knockout bracket because, you know, you have, like, a strong chance. You, you have, yeah, you're, you're Brazil, you're France, you're, I don't know, Germany, is soccer powerhouse, and you can just actually play just one game because... You know, bad luck. You and that that happens very often in in soccer, and indeed not so often in other sports because you know you yeah basically in one game you have so many points that are scored that you can really in the end say who who was the best of the two teams. Okay, thank mm. you, sir.
Great. Well, thank you, Julian, and thank you, judges, uh, for all of this. Thank you to everyone for joining the Research Papers Finals. We will announce the winner at the Alpha Awards tonight. Uh, the Alpha Awards start at 6 p.m. Eastern. Um, and so thank you, everyone, for joining and enjoy the rest of the conference. Take thank care. You. Great. And judges, um, if you could just stay on here, we might be able to, to debrief on this. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.